From songbirds to salamanders, bats to bullfrogs, get your questions ready and give our panel of experts a call. The Kentucky Wild Call-In Show starts right now. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> first Saint Leo. Yeah, look here. It's a keeper. Here it goes. Boom. Oh, oh. Wow, that happened. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Tonight, we're coming to you live from Lexington, Kentucky, and we're answering all your questions about many of our species we have here in Kentucky that make outdoor recreation much more enjoyable. We have a panel here on, on staff to answer all of our questions, and to reach us, you can reach us at 1-800-944-4664. So tonight is the Kentucky Wild Call-In Show. If you want to learn more about Kentucky Wild, which is a great program here that deals with all of our species that just make outdoor recreation more enjoyable, uh, you can go to fw.ky. or backslash uh, Kentucky or KY Wild to get more information. That's fw.ky slash KY Wild to get more information. Uh, with me today, I have Kate Slankert, avian biologist. How you doing? Good, thank you. We have Monty McGregor who is our aquatic biologist. You guys are very familiar faces out here. We've had you on here many times before. And we have John McGregor, the state herpetologist. How you doing, John? I'm doing fine. We've no, got relation, no relation to him. No relation. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get straight to the questions today. Uh, we've got quite a few questions that have already been submitted via Facebook. And uh, we're gonna jump right in. Uh, <clears throat> Richard uh, on Facebook wants to know, are there any snakes in Kentucky that are protected by law? We have one snake that's protected by law, and that's the copper belly water snake, which is in the western coal field. And it was proposed for being listed as a federally threatened species in the early 90s. And so the state protected it, and it's still protected even though it's no longer recognized as a subspecies. So we protect a snake that doesn't exist. <laughs> How cool is that? Well, just in case, huh? <laughs> yep. All right, let's go to our next question. This is Cody Brown. This is an Instagram question. He said he heard that we might have armadillos in Kentucky, and what type of uh, population numbers may we have? I know you've done a lot of studies with armadillos over yeah, the years. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm the armadillo guy, so uh, when someone sees one, they you know, send an inquiry or a photo, and, and we have a pretty good distribution map now. We have armadillos all the way from the western end of the state to about I-65, and then we've even got them further east now. Uh, two years ago, there were two found dead in Lake Cumberland, different parts of the lake. We've got them as far east as Knott County, uh, Powell County, and Moorhead. So, uh, Any precautions people need to take when encountering an armadillo? Not really. I mean, they're a natural carrier of leprosy, mm -hmm. but I don't know if anyone's ever caught leprosy from an armadillo. Okay. Um, they have long claws so they can scratch you, and they have, they have little peg teeth. They have fewer teeth than any other mammal, so oh, wow. okay. you don't have to worry about one biting you. Okay, all right. Uh, we've actually had several questions uh, about a snake that was posted on Facebook and Instagram. People are wanting to know what type of snake this is. So if you want to see the snake, check out our Facebook page, and uh, it was posted on earlier on Kentucky Field. John, you looked at that picture. What kind of snake? I did. That was a really big female common water snake. And okay. it was photographed over in, in Wolf County in the Red River Gorge at a pond. And these are very common snakes. The big ones get that big around and close to four feet long. Okay. I mean, an average common water snake is more like two feet. But they are in every pond, ditch, stream, river. Uh, they feed mostly on fish and frogs. 
and they clean up a lot of fish guts okay. you know, that, that are left behind by fishermen. So, okay. uh, you know, they're, they're not harmful particularly, although in a fish hatchery they might not be a good thing to have around. <laughs> So common water snake. Common water so snake. That, that is your answer for all the people that have that have looked at that uh, picture and want to know exactly what snake that is. There you go, common water snake. The next question is Mark, and this is also a Facebook question. Are there mussels in eastern Kentucky that are edible and not protected? Monty, this is right up your alley. You deal with That's mussels nice. every single day, so what about that? Well, uh, most all the mussels are protected. So there are a few mussels that live in ponds. So if you have a private pond, typically, and you stock fish in it, it might have some mussels in it that you could eat. Yeah. Uh, most people don't eat them because they typically harbor a lot of sand and you'll chew on sand a lot. And they don't taste very good and not very nutritious. But that would be the only ones that I'd recommend if you wanted to try eating them and find a farm pond that you know about the water quality in it and you could take one out of a farm pond. Okay, okay. And you actually brought a couple of those too, didn't you? Yeah, uh, the, the, typically the two species that I see in the, in the farm ponds or the giant floater, and this is a small one, mm -hmm. and then the paper pond shell, and uh, this is the really thin shells, and they, they're called floaters because uh, when they die, they seal their shell up, and then uh, the gases decompose, and they'll float up like little boats on the top, and then they'll end up on the bank. So a lot of times you'll find them washed up on the bank, uh, and they're not from an animal necessarily collected, like a muskrat or a raccoon. They sometimes just die of old, you know, they're only three or four years old, and they'll die and wash up on the bank, and that's where the name floater comes from. So a mussel like that, and a lot of people don't know a whole lot about mussels, but mussels start out extremely, extremely small. How old did, would it, how long would it take a mussel to get to that size? This one's only about three years old. Wow. So it, it got it went from the size of about half a piece of salt, size mm -hmm. of a piece of salt, to this in about three years. And so this one's actually a fairly fast growing animal. Most of them don't grow very fast. Maybe they get to about the size of a quarter in one year and then they uh, like these some of the uh, three ridges, they can live. This one here's about fifty years old. Wow. And so it took a long time to get to this age, and, and some of them even can live over 100 years. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Uh, Will Perryman, uh, this is an Instagram question. Why are some crawfish red and some blue? And uh, what does this color indicate? Well, this color in, in animals is a result of genetics most of the time. Uh, with crayfish, we actually have a blue one here, the upland burrowing crayfish. Uh, sometimes their color will change based on the food that they eat and the environment that they live in. Uh, but most of the time it's genetic and some of the species are, are even uh, only our certain color and it's how we kind of help to identify them a little bit like this one. This guy here is uh, only found in the eastern mountains of Kentucky and in fact it's a new described species that doesn't have a name on it at this point. Yeah, you know, I, I spent a childhood walking creek banks and flipping over rocks and looking at crayfish. I've never seen one this blue. This, this is truly a beautiful crayfish. Yeah, this guy, he lives underground. So you'd have to go and dig in the ground, and I've actually done this. I've taken and pulled the burrow apart and stuck my arm down in a hole in the ground up to my shoulder to try to grab one of these guys. So it's a, it's a little bit scary sometimes putting your hand down, but they, uh, they live in burrows underground. I don't know if we, can get a, if we can get a shot of that, but that thing is as blue as, as any crayfish that, uh, that I've ever seen. It makes you uh, know when fishermen take out uh, a lure and use something that's blue in color, um, here's, what you're, here's what you're imitating. Check out how bright, bright blue. It doesn't even doesn't even look natural. It's so blue. It's pretty amazing. It's very pretty. You know, <clears throat> obviously I'm an avid hunter and an avid fisherman, and uh, many people throughout the throughout the state of Kentucky do hunt and fish. But it's animals that you come across like that, or sitting in a deer stand and you see an owl or a bird of prey. That's really what makes a lot of our outdoor recreation very, very, very enjoyable. And that's really what Kentucky Wild is all about, is it not? Right. I mean, it's about all the species that we don't necessarily pursue hunting or fishing that, that, that are extremely important for ecosystem. And if you go out and you spend a day and you only saw animals that you were, that you were hunting, you would have a pretty boring day in a deer stand or, or chasing rabbits or whatever you elected to do. So if you want to support those particular animals, the way to do that is to join Kentucky Wild. Kentucky Wild's now been around since uh, June 1st of last year, and we're about 1,500 members. But the interesting thing is, We've got representation from 31 states. 31 states are now are now logged in, and and uh, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So uh, learn more about that. Please check that out. Next question, Carrie uh, on Facebook. There there are cottonmouths in Kentucky, or are there cottonmouths in Kentucky? And if so, what parts? They are not common in Kentucky. They're only found in the western coal field and the Jackson Purchase and land between the lakes. So. 
from Lexington, you have to go all the way right to around Owensboro before you get <clears throat> the areas where cottonmouths are. They live in high quality forested swamps and they live in big colonies. Mm -hmm. um, but across the state, they are not common and anything in eastern and southern Kentucky that people call a water moccasin is just going to be a harmless common water snake. Common water snake. And that was the picture that we had on yeah. our on our Facebook page. Yeah, so we do have cottonmouths, but they're only in western Kentucky and they're not common. Tony, Facebook question, said he's seeing more blue-tailed lizards around. Any reason why? And he says he lives in Uniontown, Kentucky. I, I know where Union, Kentucky is, but I don't know where Uniontown, Kentucky is, but he's seeing a whole lot of uh, blue-tailed lizards. And you just ha so happened yeah, to have yeah, bought I just one happened to. I just happened to have one, and I don't know whether anybody can zoom in on this thing or not. This is a newly hatched... Um, broad-headed skink mm -hmm. and the baby skinks we have three different kinds that have blue tails when they're babies um, and that blue tail is supposedly the biologists used to think it was a, a marker that kept the adult male skinks from attacking the babies because they're pretty aggressive toward each other but now we're finding out that actually when the when the skink dives into the leaf litter to get away from a a grackle or some kind of enemy that, that leaves that tail sticking up out of the litter and, and it starts to wiggle like this and it attracts the predator and the predator grabs the blue wiggly thing and then the skink just detaches its tail and gets away. But uh, I was, I found this one yesterday and I was trying to photograph it and it was running around on the ground. It came to a dead halt all of a sudden and the tail started lashing and it threw its mouth open and it had run in front of a big wolf spider, and the wolf spider grabbed it. Oh, wow. And it was really cool. So uh, I took some pictures of that, and then I, I would tried to get the spider to move to a different position, and the spider let the skink go, and the skink is you know, kind of, and I thought, well, he's not going to make it, you know. And, and so I picked him up and, and brought him home, and he's fine. He's eating, been eating sow bugs this afternoon. So, uh, so how many times can they... Uh, release their tail and will it grow well, back? It'll and how, grow back. And how uh, long will that? How long does that process take? It usually a, a couple of months. Okay. And it never grows back as nice as the original. Okay. Like if this guy's tail came off when it came back, it wouldn't be blue. Okay. It would probably be just gray. And then when they get older, that blue color fades. And uh, but they can always regenerate their tails. So you know, a common saying is a uh, cat has nine lives. We pr probably should have said blue-tailed skink have X amount of lives because yeah, yeah, <laughs> skink has nine tails <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Melanie from Instagram: Do do snakes really keep or do black snakes really keep venomous snakes away? Well, I, I don't know what a black snake is. You yeah. know, we we have black king snake and they eat venomous snakes, mm -hmm. copperheads and small rattlers. Black racer, which also eats other snakes, including copperheads. And then the, the rat snake, which is what people call a black snake, they don't eat snakes. Okay. They eat rodents and, and birds. So, but copperheads, for instance, they know when there's a black king snake close by or a racer, and they'll freeze up, uh, they'll huff up their body, and they'll start banging all around with a, a loop of their body, and they try to protect themselves that way and it's really interesting to see that but a uh, king snake or a racer you know he'll just grab it by the head and racers just chew their heads and until they're a bloody pulp and then just swallow them whole and then uh, but a king snake's a constrictor have you seen that happen in the wild i've before? seen that happen wow that's pretty that's it's pretty, pretty cool that's pretty cool that's pretty cool sight. but you as much as you love snakes you probably hate to see the uh the copperheads are come that way but hey that's part of copperheads it. are my favorite snakes <laughs> But, I know you've heard you, I've heard you say that. But, We've actually went out turning over tens looking for copperheads before. Yeah. And I remember you telling me they're your favorite. So. I found ten copperheads yesterday. It was a good day. <laughs> and only and one, they got all your fingers uh, to talk about. Only one racer and only one king snake. <laughs> but you don't pick them up, do you? Nope. Yeah, I know it, but uh, you, you yeah, don't pick them up. It's a lesson you learn the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> Adam Fields' Instagram question. I've heard that we have both freshwater jellyfish and a species of scorpion here in Kentucky. Now, we've, we've talked about this, and I know... You know a little bit about the uh, the freshwater uh, jellyfish, and I think you're actually have done some studies on scorpions, right? I've been stung four times by scorpions in Kentucky. Oh wow! It's not as bad as a paper wasp, <laughs> oh. you know, but yeah. it's, but they're pretty common all across southern Kentucky and west to like Fort Knox and you know Meade County and that area, and 
all the way south to the Tennessee line. They're little bitty scorpions. It's called the Southern Unstriped Scorpion, or UK calls them the Southern Devil Scorpion. But okay. Uh, and they're pretty common, and they're under rocks and boards, and they hang on the underside of the rock, and when you lift up the rock to look for snakes, sometimes you put your finger right on the scorpion. Oh, okay. That's what happened to me. That's how you got it. Uh, <laughs> and and what about these uh, freshwater jellyfish? I have seen these before. And, yeah, they're uh, typically we'd... in, like, lakes, uh, sometimes ponds, and uh, uh, they're, they're harmless, and uh, you, most people don't see them because they're fairly small. They're not any color to them like mm -hmm. the, some of the other jellyfish that mm -hmm. you see in the ocean. But we have we have them in, in several parts of the state. What, people what people who fish at night sometimes see them in yeah. places like Laurel River Lake. Laurel River Lake, and then I've also seen them on Cedar Creek, which uh, I, I know that's a, a newer impoundment. Well, I've seen them out there as well. Have you seen them in the wild as well around? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vicky, Facebook question. I've heard that a snake that swims on, swims on top of the water is venomous, but if it swims under the water, it's not. Is this true? Uh, yes and no. Uh, most snakes that are not aquatic, when they swim, they're not real good at it, and so they're kind of buoyant. But, uh, and, and the regular water snakes swim with just their head, just right at the surface. But all of the venomous snakes are heavy bodied and they have a big lung full of air and they're not very good at submerging themselves. So uh, cottonmouths, rattlesnakes, and copperheads will all swim almost floating on the water. But so will a hognose snake and they're harmless. All right, we, I want to get you a bird question. I'm sifting oh. through here. Uh, if you got a bird question, uh, this this is your person right here. Uh, Kate, Kate's got your answers. I, you study uh, a lot of birds, but uh, you really like the raptors. But you do songbirds and sure, raptors, all, songbirds, whippoorwills, all that kind of stuff. We we've got a couple questions here. I finally have found something about a bird. We're going to ask you this question oh, here. Okay. Uh, this uh, Stephen here from looks like Danville has birds nesting in his chimney every single August. He wants to know if they're chimney swifts. How common are they and are they protected? They're probably chimney swifts and they are protected by state and federal laws. Um, they're somewhat common, but they're kind of spotty. Y you know, we can't always explain why we have chimney swifts in some areas and not others, but it's certainly neat to have them around. Pretty cool, yeah. yeah. Whatever reason, John, this year it's the, it's the season of the year of the cotton mouse. All these questions are for cotton mouse. Uh, where do they exist in Kentucky? We've kind of talked a little bit about where that is. Um, are there cotton mouse in Greenup County near Greenbow Lake? <laughs> Nowhere that, near. That would be way outside of their range. Um, we also got which is more common in Kentucky, water moxin or copperhead? It's not even close. There's a whole lot more. Copperheads are probably in every county, and, and they are statewide. They're, they're rare in the bluegrass, but the rest of the state, one of the most common snakes is the copperhead. So we, uh, people have a lot of interest this year in, uh, in water moccasins. We've got tons of questions on them. <laughs> um, all right, here's Richard, Facebook question. Do catfish eat mussels? Uh, blue catfish in particular, that's one of their most favorite foods. And uh, I've actually pulled some uh, mussels that were about three or four inches out of, of the stomach of a blue catfish. Really? Now, this was a 30 or 40 pounder. So, so if you want a, a fish for blue catfish, find the mussel beds in the, in the big rivers and lakes, and they'll be right on top of those mussel beds. So blue catfish are, tend to be a fish that uh, you find like in the water column, but they're obviously going down and t taking these things up off the bottom, huh? Yeah, they're seasonal on their migrations and stuff, and, but they, they love to eat mussels. Wow. All right, Bill uh, from Elliott County wants to know, what creature is making a screeching sound at night? We don't... Bill didn't send us a, uh, a sample of this screeching sound. Could be a bird. What else could make some type of a screeching sound at night? I would guess maybe it's an owl. A lot of young owls, a lot of different species will make a screech. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe a fox. Skunk. Skunk, okay. Bigfoot. <laughs> oh, I'm sure the Bigfoot questions are going to be in here somewhere. I'm sure we're going to get some of those. You know, you and I have done a show in the past, uh, and it could be found on our YouTube channel. We did, a, we did a piece on barn owls. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, they do a screech. Now that's A screech, cool. a scream, a yell, yeah, whatever, neck, yeah. whatever it is. You walk through the woods and you hear that, you're probably going to tiptoe back out. It's pretty horrific, isn't it? Makes you want to go back in the house, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, this is Roy from Greenup County. Are Kentucky fence lizards still present? Yeah, they're pretty common. Um, <clears throat> they are mostly in wooded areas, and they like living on the like the bark of pine trees or 
dead trees, fence posts, uh, wood piles, and fence lizard, lizards are doing pretty well in the state. Okay, great. Ryan, a Facebook question. How many species of li lizards live here in Kentucky, and which one is the most common? <laughs> we, we have 10 kinds of lizards, okay. which is pretty, we used to just have eight, but we now have two that have come in from elsewhere and gotten started. Mm -hmm. you know, the wall lizard is up in uh, northern Kentucky and lives in kind of rock walls and, and waste areas. And we also have a uh, Mediterranean house gecko, which started out in the, in the Caribbean islands and it's made it to the U.S. and we have them now in 20 or 30 places in Kentucky. Oh, wow. And they will come to porch lights at, no at night uh, they're little, interesting little geckos with uh, with the big big toes. Oh yeah. Uh, but probably the commonest normal lizard in the state would be either the fence lizard or the five line skink. Okay. And both of those are just about statewide. Statewide. All right. Jim from Washington County wants to know if there's any documented cases of uh, copperheads or rattlesnakes being found in Washington County. Neither one. Neither one have Neither ever. Neither one. Yeah. We have no venomous snake records from Washington County. The kind of the, the southwestern corner of the county probably has copperheads, but no one's ever found one. There. Wow, okay. There you go. If you're, if you're afraid of snakes, yeah. there's your county. <laughs> yeah, take a picture and send it to me. Cause yeah. you know, we're, we're actually trying to finish up a Kentucky amphibians and reptiles book. And uh, so I've been working on the maps and they're about done, but if someone finds a copperhead in Washington County, we can, Stick it in there. Okay, fantastic. You know, and you always love to get pictures. Of, pictures if someone thinks they found a, a snake that, or, or or a reptile, or whatever that may, may be very unique, you can always email you a picture. Yeah, I, I love that stuff. I, <laughs> I live for my morning email. Yeah, <laughs> let's see what somebody sent to get identified, and it's always cool stuff. Oh yeah, so there you go. What is your email address if for someone wants to send oh, a picture? It's uh, John Matt Gregor at ky.gov, but just Send it to to our uh, you know our regular uh, info center info, In, info center, center and they can get and it to you. They'll send it to me. Yeah, if you ever if you ever have any questions here at the Department of Fish and Wildlife or you want to reach out and leave a message for any of the people on the staff, it's all the same number. It's our it's our normal 1-800-858-1549 number. Uh, call. Uh, be glad to take any of your questions if we're in the office or get back in touch with you if you have something that you think is unique or a question that you want to have answered. And that's not just for the biologists on the panel, it's anyone that works in the department. Uh, Sheila from Caldwell County, uh, if you can eat mussels, what's the best way to cook them? Have you ever, have you ever just caught, have you ever picked one up and just cooked it? Not freshwater mussels. Yeah. Uh, so when you work with them, you know too much about them. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, um, you got to be careful. First off, that you're that right. you're not getting one that's not allowed to be picked up, right. like you said, out of a personal pond or something right. like that. And that would be the safest place. And so, uh, you know, most most people eat like oysters raw and stuff, and which is a no no in my my book. But uh, but anyway, if you you could cook them and uh, boil them uh, or fry them, and you could eat them that way. But again, you're gonna they're not very tasteful, so you'd have to put a lot of sauces and stuff like that on them and. Okay. If you were going to try to taste, eat them, <laughs> if you I wouldn't to. recommend it because they they do harbor a lot of a lot of bacteria and a lot of toxicants and stuff. And you, if you're not familiar with the area, you, you collect them, uh, you could harm yourselves. And so you have to watch that kind of stuff. You know, and, I, and I've spoke to fisheries biologists over the years about certain freshwater fish, wanting to know, hey, would this be good to use in some form of a of a recipe that is raw? And really, you shouldn't eat any raw fish out of freshwater, should you not? I mean, I've heard that all of them carry some type of parasites and probably not a good idea to eat raw There's fish. There's more things on these animals than you realize if, yeah. if you start looking at them. <laughs> I remember speaking to uh, one of our uh, fisheries directors and I, at that time I was experimenting with some ceviche and I thought, hey, I wonder how this would be. And he looked at me and goes, I, I don't recommend that because I would not, even you know, in that situation, you're putting the lime juice in and he goes, I wouldn't recommend eating any, any fish out of fresh water with no cooking whatsoever. Right. So, uh, Jim from Falmouth, Kentucky, uh, do you have a permit to collect venomous snakes? Do you have to have one to milk them at a lab? <clears throat> I get that every year from people. Uh, you can keep in your possession for personal use up to five of any native Kentucky snake. Mm -hmm. That includes copperhead, timber rattlesnake, cottonmouth, as long as there's not a city ordinance against mm -hmm. it. But in terms of milking them and selling the venom, 
It's a complicated issue. Uh, the venom has to be pure. Uh, and there's, there's an actual, the Kentucky Reptile Zoo is the only certified facility in the state that provides venom from venomous snakes to uh, researchers and, and people who develop the antivenom. And everything is done under sterile conditions. Mm -hmm. And they so, actually freeze dry that to ship it, it's my understanding, Yeah, right? they do. So yeah. it's not like you're just taking a vial of venom and you're sending it off to keep, it's being, it's being frozen, because uh, you don't want to be right. package handling something and realize, oh my gosh, I, what is this? Yeah, and, and it's, and I mean, it's sterile. If, if you go and catch a rattlesnake and, and milk it, you know, make it spit venom into a tube, you have probably damaged the snake's venom glands, and you pr you're probably going to get uh, blood and, and other uh, materials in the venom. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not going to be pure. It's, it's not going to be useful for anything. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So you highly recommend it. You're probably not going to find yourself a buyer for something like that. And uh, no, but if you want to go more into that as a business, first thing you want to do is get a job at the Kentucky Reptile Zoo and work, <laughs> work there for a couple of years. So you know what you're doing. They may get bombarded with uh, job requests. And <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, if you've seen Jim Harrison, he's missing several fingers. And, oh, yeah. I mean, it's a dangerous thing, what he does. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Richard from, uh, looks like, Jefferson County. Um, how do you keep chip, chipmunks out of your flower pots? Any ideas here? You, you can live trap them pretty easily. Yeah. And that's about the only thing I could think of that you could do. Uh, you can go to uh, like southern states and get a <clears throat> get these uh, have a heart traps for small mammals, and chipmunks are easy to catch. You can bait them in with peanut butter, sunflower seeds, or pieces of apple, and then you can just transport them to the other side of town and let them go. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I suggest. <laughs> get a dog. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, this is Mike from Boone County. Uh, this is a question for you. He wants to know uh, how the falcons in Boone County are doing. Uh, they are doing really well. We have falcons nesting at a power plant there, and every year they produce chicks, and so you could possibly see them flying along the river there. So I actually don't live that far off the river myself, mm -hmm. and I, I wish I'd have gotten a picture. I'm pretty sure that I had a falcon. Are there, are there the, the new East yeah. Bridge, East End Bridge in Louisville? Are there any falcons nested in, in and around that bridge? We don't know if I'm nesting there, but honestly, if you're on the Ohio River, you could very well see a falcon yeah. on oh, any yeah. day. They just kind of go up and down that river, you know, in between different falcon sites, and they like the bridges and the high buildings, and so it's a good place to look for them. That's, that is really cool. I'll tell you what, falcons are pretty cool, pretty cool bird yeah. to see, isn't it? Yeah, they are. Um, Den Denton from Rowan County. Uh, can a red or gray fox climb trees? Gray foxes climb trees a lot. Um, red foxes, not so much, but the gray fox is a woodland animal and uh, they, they often climb trees. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, Nathan from Leslie County got a question about box turtles. He says that, uh, uh, that they seem to be moving out of the area of Leslie County. Any ideas or any, you see anything about that? <clears throat> I haven't seen any changes in box turtle numbers, but Something we have noticed the last few years are box turtle die-offs, and uh, <clears throat> there, there's a, a disease called ranavirus, and it's they can it's spread through fish, um, amphibians, and it also affects box turtles, and they will become lethargic. Their eyes start to <clears throat> weep, and they stop eating, and uh, a lot of times they'll go to a pond or go to water and they just kind of slowly die. Um, and our vet that we used to have was pretty interested in that. And so uh, we would try to collect turtles if there was a sign of an outbreak and, and get them sent off to the uh, Southern Disease Lab. But uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure anything can be done about it, but okay. it's just something that happens. And, and it, it appears it kills some box turtles and then they, the rest of them survive and it's gone. So uh, there might be something to that. This next question is from David in Nicholasville. This is, uh, this is not, I guess it's a question. It's technically a question. It just said, hey, what critters did John bring today? <laughs> That's his question. So we've already looked at, <clears throat> yeah. uh, we've already looked at uh, one of the things you had, which was the blue-tailed skink. Yep. What else have you got over there? Well, the only other thing I brought, uh, my wife really likes baby turtles. And... 
a couple of years ago, I was out at <clears throat> uh, one of our wildlife areas in uh, Clear Creek Wildlife Management Area, and I found a musk turtle had laid eggs on the ground and hadn't buried them. So I brought the eggs home, and here is a little baby musk turtle that's about a year old. Uh, okay, that turtle there is a year old. When they hatch How out, they're the size of a small acorn. Okay. And uh, a full-grown musk turtle isn't all that big. It's only, yeah. it's only about like that. But uh, these are really common turtles across the state. Um, <clears throat> and they're, they feed mostly on carrion. So mm -hmm. like if you clean fish at the edge of a stream or a lake, if you go back at night with a flashlight, the turtles that are there eating, eating all the fish remains are going to always, almost always be musk turtles. Okay. But they also come and they'll nibble on whatever's on your stringer. Okay, so across the across the, the state, every county can these be found. Yeah, they we don't have records from all the counties, but they 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 occur statewide, okay. and they pretty much stay in the water all the time. Sometimes you find one up on the bank or basking. And this is the only turtle that normally will climb trees. I guess it makes it the gray fox of turtles. <laughs> <laughs> they have, I've seen them 10, 15 feet up really? on a tree overhanging the water. And uh, when you get close to them, they'll just drop in, and it sounds like somebody threw a brick in the water. That's those, but, Yeti, those Yeti sightings we keep hearing about where they're throwing rocks in. Know, we, now we know what they I, are. I, I kind of think that. A, mu a musk it. turtle. But this is a musk turtle. <laughs> also called a stink pot because they have really powerful uh, scent glands. And when you pick one up, they, uh, this, you know, this one won't do it because it's too little. Well, it, but, uh, s smelly smells aren't real good for TV anyhow. <laughs> so we'll, we'll yeah. go on to the next question here. They do smell really. I like the smell. <laughs> I know. Uh, John, that's the reason yeah. we have you sit down there. You bring, I, those, you bring those snakes in and they always musk all over the place. So, he, he, Monty, I put you down there with him. Yeah. Oh, he actually sorry. musked on my fingers and I can smell it. <laughs> I can come over there and you can smell it. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we have uh, Laurel County question. Scorpions, how venomous are they? And uh, are they making a comeback? They said they're seeing lots of them. They're, they've always been common in Laurel County. They're not very venomous. It's, it's uh, less painful than a paper wasp. Okay. The thing I like about our scorpions is they actually feed on wasps and other insects. So they will wipe out a wasp nest that's underneath a, you know, like the eave of your uh, outhouse or garage or something mm -hmm. like that. They feed on the wasps. Oh, really? So, I mean, they eat other other insects too. But well, bring on the scorpions. Yeah, I just and, and they're, not, they're, the they're not painful, and they can't <laughs> fly after you. <laughs> there you go. But they will crawl on your shoe. <laughs> <clears throat> we have a question here about rattlesnakes. How many species of rattlesnakes are there going to take? We've talked about that. We got uh, two. Two. Timber rattlesnake is the only one that's widespread. Mm -hmm. and, you know, just to bring this up, I, I was looking at deaths from snake bite statistics on Thursday, and in the history of Kentucky, there have only been six deaths from snake bite that I can find information on. All six of them were timber rattlesnakes, and they took place in snake handling churches. Really? Is that... So if you're, if you're fearful, you're, if you're going to take treatment and you're fearful for go, going out and hiking uh, the Daniel Boone and for snake bite, there's never been a case of that yeah, happening. Get, it's a person dying. Get to the hospital, get medical attention, mm -hmm. and you'll survive it. Yeah. Uh, there you go. You heard it. You heard it from the man right there. Who has been bitten by a venomous snake? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, are, are cotton mouths aggressive? And is it true that uh, when they that they will come to light when shown on when shown on the water? Have you ever have you ever seen that before? I have. I have seen that. Uh, okay. I was out with Bill Hendricks, and we were photographing a cottonmouth at night that was swimming, and I would turn my headlight on, and it would come toward me, and he would photograph it. And then I would turn, when it got close, I'd turn my light off, and he'd turn his on, and it would turn around. <laughs> it was really, we had a lot of fun with that cottonmouth. That, that's pretty cool. So there but, you go. It is true. That's, they are they're yeah. not aggressive. Um, they will, they'll throw that mouth open, and they'll vibrate that tail, and they'll spray the scent up into the air, but... <clears throat> I mean, you can literally put your foot on one and roll it around, and it probably, probably won't bite. <laughs> <coughs> we don't recommend that. <laughs> we don't but, recommend that. But yeah, yeah. Duke Wilder used to teach at Murray State. You know, he studied cottonmouths for years at Murphy's Pond, and I watched him do that. And I thought, you know, that's about the stupidest thing I've ever seen anyone do. <laughs> 
but and, uh, uh, but so they're, they're they're not gonna they're not gonna hunt you down uh, and 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 strike you. They, this is a uh, snake that's very thick bodied. It's just gonna hold its ground and throw its mouth open. And let yeah, you know they would there. run if they weren't so fat. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of a common characteristic of things that are big around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you defend yourself because you can't run. We have another bird question here. Andy from Somerset wants to know about the common loon uh, he, in, in spring and in fall. Is anyone monitoring their populations? I don't know if he's seeing more or less. I've been seeing quite a few on, on yeah. Dale Hollow. There's a bunch of them and Cumberland. Well, that's a waterfowl question, so we don't monitor them. I don't think our waterfowl program does monitor them either, but I'll be honest, I'm not sure. Okay, all right. <laughs> hey. Sometimes you, that's why you call the number, <laughs> fw.ky.gov, and, and, and look up who the, the biologist may be there in your you area, go. or you can call us at 1-800-858-1549, and we'll get someone that can answer that question. Uh, Mike from Shelby County wants to know if you've ever seen a blue bullfrog. Yeah. <clears throat> Every year, uh, somebody calls about a blue bullfrog. Uh, I've had two blue bull, bullfrog calls this year. Uh, last year there was someone in Mer uh, Mercer County who had one in his pond, and I drove down to his house and tried to photograph it, and I couldn't get very close to it. But it just happens once in a while. There, there, there's a missing pigment in the skin, and it <clears throat> in instead of the green light uh, being reflected, it's complicated. But uh, if the green pigment is missing, then the blue that's there gets reflected back out, and the frog looks blue. Oh, wow. So... Uh, so it's a it's a bullfrog that's missing a, a pigment. Yeah, we, we just did a frog gigging piece just a couple weeks ago, and we were out looking for bullfrogs. And I'll tell you, they can range in colors pretty yeah. pretty dramatically. I mean, you can have a bright orange, you can have yellow, you can have just some really wild colors on the bottom of them. I want to go to that pond. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say bright orange, but it was an orangish tone, and it was some, yeah. and then the yellow, and then you got the normal green colors that you see, but. The really big ones we were, we were seeing, they had a lot of yellow and some color, almost orange looking on their bellies. It was a really interesting deal. Oh, you, that we, would be a breeding male with a bright yellow-orange throat. Yeah, yeah, that's what we were seeing, yeah. Samantha uh, from Metcalf County, um, why can't you eat a water dog? Are we talking, uh, what, what is a water dog? Is that a common name for something here? That's I know the we've mud got puppy a that mud we have puppy. It's the same thing. Okay. And uh, so it's a... Uh, we actually have one of these species. We do. And we have... Uh, we have uh, so this, this is a salamander, right? Right. And I'll let John answer that question because he's the herpetologist. I just happened to bring it because I had it at our entry. <laughs> yeah, you, you, can, you can actually eat a water dog if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, when I've been to herpetology meetings where you have a bunch of crazy people <laughs> that study <laughs> amphibians and reptiles that don't get together every year for a meeting, and one of the things that they've done was they've had... You know, you get to taste different species, and water dog was one of them, and I refused to eat one. <laughs> but, uh, no, it probably tastes just like chicken, just like everything else. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this here is, you know, they, they, they called it a water dog. What, what, was, uh, what was the name you called it earlier? A mud puppy. A mud puppy. And then we also have another big salamander that we're doing some research on here in Kentucky, and it's called a? A hellbender. A hellbender. So... Uh, this this particular one here, I don't know if we can get a good good shot of that. This is a tell me some interesting characteristics about this mud puppy. Well, it's slimy and, and uh, they get a little bit bigger than this, but a, a real big one is 16 inches long. Uh, they've got bright red gills, and that's how you tell a a mud puppy from a hellbender. Hellbenders don't have external gills. Okay. Um, these things they feed on fish eggs, snails, uh, young fish. Worms. Uh, fishermen catch these a lot, mm -hmm. especially on night crawlers or uh, chicken livers, chicken gizzards. Uh, they're probably in every stream in the state and every big stream, and they're in a lot of lakes also. Uh, pretty interesting. It's probably mistaken for a snake if you get a quick glimpse of it in the water. Yeah, they're they're really slimy. And it's. Do you want to try to pick it up? Or? <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't want to hurt it. There we go. There you go. Oop. So, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Really, really slippery. So <laughs> yeah, I've got slime on. And these, these are, and these are. Pick it up versus me. He slimed me. 
<laughs> like, do I want to pick it up? That's why you brought it in that glass container, huh? That's exactly right. Pretty, inter <laughs> pretty interesting species. Now, and and Namani, you keep these. You keep some of these for an uh, interesting reason, and that is what? Well, this happens to be a host for a freshwater mussel called the salamander mussel. Okay. So, so that particular mussel has to have this present to deposit its eggs. It basically has to ha ha release its larval stage onto this gill of this uh, mud puppy and it lives on that for two or three weeks and then it'll drop off and start its life as a juvenile mussel which is still about the size of a piece of salt at that point. So, so the, 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 the mussel populations, you can't really bring back the mussel populations without first making sure that you have a good number of populations of whatever the host right. is for that particular mussel right. and for that one it's the salamander. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> salamander mussel, okay. All right, um, here we go. Uh, Ryan from Boyle County, how common is the brown phase of a screech owl opposed to the red or the gray phase? I mean, you can find it. We have both red, gray, and brown in Kentucky, or all of those. And so, um, you know, I guess it's less common than the other two, but it's certainly around, not terrible to find. Okay. Bob from Cincinnati, when do mosquitoes and ticks die out in the fall in northern Kentucky? You can't give, a, can't give an exact date on this, but it, it takes something to happen, doesn't it? <laughs> I get ticks on me any month of the year. Yeah. All it takes is a warm day. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it used to be ticks, a lot of ticks died off in the winter, but our winters are getting warmer. And uh, But a good yeah. hard freeze will definitely knock the numbers back on, on them, right? It knocks them back. But yeah. But when do they all die off? Well, they, they, they don't. <laughs> yeah. With mosquitoes, it's different. I mean, they, they're definitely... Not going to be around in the winter time, but we have a lot of different species, and they each have a different life cycle. Well, here you go. You said you get ticks every single month of the year. Kristen from Upton, Kentucky, wants to know what the best spray for ticks is. I use Repel with 40% DEET. Okay. And for the seed ticks, the ones, those really tiny ones that get all over your pants, those are awful, and uh, they die right on my pants as long as I've kept myself sprayed down. So there you go, repel 40% deep. That's what you recommend that's, when you're out in the That's one of them, but there are several others that are good. Mm -hmm. Kelly, Facebook question, what kind of copperhead population does Bracken County have? Bracken County is one of those counties we don't have a copperhead record from. Okay, so okay. That's not saying that they're not there, or that, you know, but uh, yeah, Mason, Bracken, and uh, what's the next one up the line? Uh, maybe Pendleton. We have one, one site in Pendleton County. Uh, they're in Campbell and Kenton and Campbell right along the Licking River, real steep wooded hills. Bracken County probably has a few, but maybe the wooded hills facing the Ohio River. Okay. But they're not going to be common there. All right. Terry Lee from Marion County wants to know what can be done about black-headed buzzards. When did we get this question? Uh, he said he's having a problem with them. He doesn't say exactly what the problem is, Okay. but uh, black-headed buzzards, what, uh, what can be done? It kind of depends on your problem. I, I assume maybe he's having a problem with livestock. Um, black vultures can be attracted to um, livestock birthing sites, and if they're causing trouble, a landowner can call the Kentucky Farm Bureau and obtain a permit um, so that they can legally take a few vultures. Um, we found that if they take vultures, if they hang the dead bird in a tree, that helps um, to keep the vultures scared away from the area. I know okay. that sounds kind of weird and <laughs> a little bit gross, but it can be very effective um, for keeping the vultures away for that year. So. Okay. There you go. William from Morgan County, Monarchs, how, do they, how does the Monarch differ from the Viceroy and does the Viceroy migrate? Who wants to talk about butterflies? I can deal with that. Okay. Uh, viceroys have a, a little extra line across the hind wing, um, and they do not migrate. Uh, monarchs do migrate, and they're getting to be really common this time of year in Kentucky. I've got milkweeds in my yard, and I had four monarch caterpillars. Yeah, and does uh, the viceroy also, also migrate? No, it does not. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> viceroys just, they're sedentary. I mean, they have couple of generations a year. Okay. okay. Uh, they're related to the red spotted purple, which is another butterfly about that size. Okay. They don't and, migrate. And they might migrate two to 3,000 miles down to southwestern Mexico. The that's, the, that's the monarch. Yeah. It's amazing that a, that a butterfly, as delicate and fragile they are, and the weather and the wind and the rain and whatever, can 
they can travel a couple thousand miles for the winter and then come back. It, that always amazes me that when you see one in the spring, you're thinking, man, what that thing had seen over the last couple of weeks coming back is pretty amazing. How long would it take one to get to South America or wherever um, they're going? It's, they can fly anywhere from 10 to 10 to 15 miles an hour up to 30 miles an hour sometimes if they're with the wind. Yeah. You can just do the math on how long it would take. But they're, if you ever read about the monarch, I don't really have time to talk about it to the extent, but they actually go through four different generations in a year. So the, the ones that come from, from Mexico are not the ones that go back. Okay. So it's, a, it's an interesting life cycle to know that there's three or four generations involved in that migration. So, and the last generation lives 10 months, but the first <laughs> ones only live about six or eight weeks. So wow. it's pretty cool that you, if you read about them and you'll really learn about their complexity. It's amazing they can generate enough energy off of the milkweed to literally take them that, that type of distance. I don't know that I carry much weight, but it's still amazing. Um, they use a lot of plants for nectar sources. So oh, the, okay. The milkweed is the, is the larval food, but uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of different plants that the adults get nourishment from. Okay, all right. Victor, Facebook question, uh, wants to know about homing pigeons. Uh, make, are they making a comeback? Sandy says, pigeons flying uh, the same route every single day while driving around Louisville. Okay, well, he's probably not seeing homing pigeons. Um, there, there are people that keep homing pigeons as a hobby and they're banded birds and sometimes they get loose and live out in the wild for a period of time, but he might just be seeing rock pigeons, which are city pigeons. They come in lots of different colors and um, they all go to sleep at like a communal roost at night. You know, safety in numbers, um, they're happier being with a large group of friends. And then they go out to feed at, uh, during the day somewhere. And so he's probably just seeing them coming and going maybe from a bridge where they're roosting at night. Okay, all right. John from Fleming County wants to know about the uh, river green crayfish, six inches long in Pike County. Uh, wants to know if they're uh, still in the river. Are you familiar with that? Is there one called the river green crayfish? Does There's a couple of crayfish that can get a greenish looking color up in that area, but we have a, actually a couple of different species, a newly described species from that part of the state that are, uh, they thought they were a species common in West Virginia and now that we've done some genetic work and so we have some new species in that, that part of the state. But again, the color comes from sometimes the, the food that they're eating and also uh, different species tend to have a little more green or blue or red or brown and black stripes and whatever it is. Okay. Uh, Sam from Jefferson County wants to know if the mockingbird population is down in the Louisville area. We're not aware of any declines in mockingbird populations, but um, you know, perhaps they're just moving around with the food sources. Okay. Uh, what kind of snake spreads its head like a cobra? I have seen this. And this is yeah. a really, really, really unique display. They're cool snakes. It's called the uh, the hognose snake, and they it's one. We only have two kinds of snakes in the state that hiss really loud hiss: mm -hmm. the pine snake and the hognose. But a hognose will, I mean, it flattens out its head and neck and hisses and. Uh, opens up its mouth and it, I mean, it's, it puts on a great display. Totally harmless. Totally harmless. But uh, it's a lot of fun to find a hognose snake. <laughs> it's gonna take you a second to realize it's totally harmless because when they flatten out yeah. and hiss, it's, it is pretty yeah. frightening. Some of them are jet black, some are khaki green, others are orange or yellow with black spots, mm -hmm. real colorful. And I had someone bring me two dead ones that they killed. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been years ago, but one was yellow with black spots and the other one was black. And the guy said, by golly, I've got proof that copperheads and black snakes are breeding together. <laughs> and it was two hognose snakes. They're making hognose yeah. snakes. <laughs> that's that's, a, that's one of the, the outcome. stories you hear, you know, that yeah, copperheads yeah. are breeding with black snakes and producing a venomous, poisonous black snake. You know? <laughs> yeah. But hey, proof the proof is in seeing it. There you go. Sam from Battletown in Meade County uh, wants to know what has happened to the grasshopper populations in Meade County. Any of you guys study grasshoppers? Know much about grasshoppers? No? Okay. Uh, Wayne from Jefferson County. He said he's seen several bald eagles in Louisville, Kentucky, and are, they mi are there migrating patterns throughout Kentucky? Well, so we actually have two bald eagle nests in Jefferson County now, and one is right near downtown Louisville. And so you can see bald eagles regularly flying over Louisville nowadays. Um, if, you, if you cross the East End Bridge in Louisville and look 
upriver towards Cincinnati on the Kentucky side, there's a bald eagle's nest you, you can, can see, see there, and there, you can yeah. literally see that bird from time to time setting in the nest. It's going to cost you to cross the bridge of the river link, but you can you can go through there and they keep your eye out. They did move their nest. So oh, they it's did. It's harder to see now. Okay. Yeah, but you could certainly see a bald eagle sitting there. Yeah, yeah. And if you go on the Ohio River in the Louisville area, I mean, you very well could see one. So. But as far as migrating through through Kentucky, we we have a resident population of bald eagles, and in the winter time, we see we do have more, right? Right, right. We have a bunch that come down from Wisconsin and Michigan, the Great Lakes area where the water freezes over in the winter. Um, they come down here to spend the winter. So mm -hmm. we have just a bunch more eagles in the winter than we do the rest of the year. I tell you, if you, if you go out on Kentucky Lake or if you go to Del Hollow, one of those lakes in the winter months, you're, you're, if you go in many coves, you're going to see a bald eagle. Yeah. They're, they're very visible, aren't they? Winter is the best time to go looking for them because the leaves are off the trees and we have a lot more of them than usual. Yep. Uh, Linda from Henderson County uh, has never seen Baltimore Orioles until this year and now she's seeing lots of them. Any ideas why? Well, it's tough to say. It could be a habitat change in her area that the birds like better than they used to. Um, Orioles are sometimes attracted to hummingbird feeders. If she's got one of those out, maybe she's seeing them because of that. Okay. Um, tough to say. Well, that's, that's, we got all kinds of bird questions. Hey, we asked and we got them, so here they <laughs> Best come. Best for last, okay. <laughs> uh, how many different kinds of hummingbirds are there in Kentucky? Well, we mostly just have the ruby-throated hummingbird, but um, in the fall, sometimes we get the rufous hummingbird, too, that comes through for a short period of time. Here's the next question. I've seen this happen several times as well. Um, I think I know your response here. Uh, Doug in Kenton County is saying every morning he's having a cardinal that is attacking its own reflection in a mirror on his truck and he wants to know what he can do to prevent that. They, they yeah. can be very territorial. Cardinals are the worst about doing this and <laughs> I always make a little bit of a joke. Cardinals don't have to migrate. They're a resident bird so they don't have to be smart enough to remember to go back and forth somewhere. <laughs> so they, possibly they're a little bit dense and they keep at this a little bit longer than the migratory bird species. But um, the best thing to do is like if they're attacking your rear view mirror, you could maybe tie a, a grocery bag over it for the day to get them to snap out of it. If they're attacking the windows of your house, maybe take a bar of soap and draw some temporary lines on it so that the bird can see that it's um, not another bird. This is, in fact, an object that it's attacking. Yeah. And so just make the glass either invisible or make it more visible to the bird. And they can do this repetitively day after day after day after day. Yeah, yeah. They can be They don't learn real fast, do they? And so <laughs> maybe you just want to stop washing your windows for a while. <laughs> Let them get dirty and less reflective. Uh, all right, we have Darren in Laurel County. He wants to know if there's hellbenders in the Rock Castle River. Yes, yes, there are. Uh, okay. They are in pretty much all our major rivers. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of records yet, but when we've done testing for environmental DNA where you take water samples and you can actually collect hellbender DNA, and we've found them to be in every major river in the state. Wow. I don't know how many are there, uh, but they're there. All right, so Bruce, uh, Fayette County, why are crows a protected species? Well, there is actually a hunting season for uh, crows, but they are federally protected. And so, um, you know, all of our native migratory birds are, are protected, and so they fall into that, you know. It's just like the ducks are protected, but there's a hunting season for them. And okay. Uh, peacocks, are peacocks wild in Kentucky? You saw a bird with a crown on it. Okay, um, they are not considered an established feral species in Kentucky, but on occasion um, a peacock will get out from a domestic bird keeper mm -hmm. and almost become feral, and we do get calls about them. They often will end up either under somebody's bird feeder or following some turkeys around, and um, but we don't see it happen real often. Peacocks make an interesting sound, don't they? They do. <laughs> you want to demonstrate that sound? <laughs> I, you know, I'd rather not, but I will admit I do have a peacock. Do you do? Okay, yeah. okay. So there you go. <laughs> um, I had a question here. Uh, someone asked a question about uh, do, um, or here's an armadillo question, but they were asking about um, a possum, wanting to know if, if uh, possums eat uh, copperheads. You know, possum. I've seen a possum eating a dead copperhead on the road. So, and possums will eat about anything. So I would say yes. Okay. No. There you go. Uh, Kara from uh, Jefferson County wants to know how they get a hummingbird out of the garage. I experienced this problem. Yeah. And I'll tell you, we thought the bird was out numerous times because you don't see them, and they just had landed somewhere, and we closed the garage door. Said finally, the bird got out. 
and a day or two later you see the bird again. How do you get one out? That's kind of, that's kind of tough. It can be tricky and so um, the birds are attracted to um, UV light and mm -hmm. so if you turn all the lights off and open a small window so that it can see the sunshine, it'll usually go straight towards it. If, in a garage it can be tougher because that um, you know garage door is so much bigger but a lot of times you have to be patient and at sunset they will fly out when they can kind of get their bearings and see the UV light a little bit better. All right, fantastic. Uh, here you go, Julie from Hart County wants to know if there's mussel surveys uh, on the Green River in Hart County. That just happens to be one of your favorite places, isn't it? It is. It's uh, one of the richest mussel places in North America, uh, in the Green River in Hart County. Uh, uh, there's 55 species historically found right there in Hart County, uh, wow. which is 70, almost 75 in the whole Green River. So you can go in, in several locations there in, in Hart County in the Green and even downstream down to Mammoth Cave and see 30 species in any one riffle. It's a very rich place and there's a lot of rare animals there as well. So be careful when you're down there not to disturb the, the endangered mussels. Fantastic. Hey, if you have interest in any of the species of animals we've been talking about tonight, or if you want to read our wildlife action plan, which really addresses a lot of the projects we have going on with some of these species that we don't necessarily hunt and fish for in the state of Kentucky, you can go to the website at fw.ky.gov and check out Kentucky Wild. And that's where you can find a lot of information on these particular particular uh, animal species. We got a question from Monty from Mayfield. What happened to the catalpa worms and bullfrogs? I anything's going on there? It's not necessarily a question for you. That's it's from, it's from Monty. So. Oh, well, I was trying to say, I didn't. <laughs> bullfrogs are, are, are doing fine, I think. Uh, Last year, our, our commission asked me to look into bullfrog populations across the state, and so I put together a little report for them and you know, discussed the breeding season and distribution. Bullfrogs are, are doing fine across the state. Catalpa worm is, is the larva of a Catalpa sphinx moth, and they're pretty common on some certain Catalpa trees. Uh, Hey, thank you for joining us here on this, this episode of uh, Kentucky Field, where we talk about all of, our pro all of our projects going on with Kentucky Wild. Uh, hey, we're going to be off air for two weeks. Make sure you join us on the 31st. We're going to be back on air, and, and uh, we got a bunch of great things coming your way. Make sure you get outdoors and enjoy seeing all these wonderful species that we have throughout the state of Kentucky.